Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Sex Ed Taught Me. This is your host, Natalie Walton. Uh, for this episode, I have Viv on, who is actually someone I grew up around. We were in the same neighborhood, went to the same schools. Um, so it's a fun episode, kind of comparing our experiences and how we grew up. Um, we talk a lot about clothing. We talk about kind of perceptions of sexuality, self-esteem, the way that you know sex plays into the way that we perceive ourselves, the way others perceive us. Um, so I am really excited to be able to share this with all of you. I, I personally thought this was really fun. Um, so without further ado, uh, here is Viv. Um, if you could introduce yourself with just a little bio about kind of who you are, any information you feel comfortable sharing, um, why you wanted to do this podcast. Sure. I wanted to keep it a little anonymous. So um, I'm Viv. I work in the arts and public history sector, and I moved around a lot as a kid, but mostly like I identify as a Delawarean. So, yeah, I grew up in Newark, Delaware, basically, and I've recently moved to Baltimore. Awesome. So you mentioned Delaware, which I know about because (laughs) because we grew up in the same general area. So can you tell me a little bit about like your perception of your hometown, where you grew up, um, maybe like any of the hometowns you lived in, any of the places you were around, just like politically, socially, the size of the school, that kind of idea? Sure. So, yeah, growing up in northern Delaware, it's a pretty small town where a lot of people, like, you know, everyone knows everyone or you know someone who knows someone. So, and the whole state of Delaware is basically like that. So, in a town that's very concentrated, I think. And um, politically, I'd say it's a pretty blue area being a college town. But, um, Yeah, so I went to a public high school. Um, So we actually went to high school together. You know how it is. (laughs) But um, yeah, it was a very large school too. Like there are over a thousand students. So pretty packed classes and a pretty diverse group of students too. So it was definitely an experience. Um, And then do you know what kind of sex ed program you had or how did you perceive the sex ed program? So this is in terms of like abstinence only, abstinence based, comprehensive. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, oh, I don't know how I would officially (laughs) classify it. Um, I think it was definitely leaned on abstinence, but they did give us like sexual advice and it wasn't abstinence only. And we did get some form of education. Yeah, yeah, no, I would, I would say about the same thing. Yeah, because it's really hard to be like, because it's not like they introduce the class typically, and they're like, okay, so this is going to be an abstinence based class, or this is going to be an abstinence only. It's kind of like a weird question. Um, But and it's also something where I think it can vary between people too, because I think certain people's ideas of like what comprehensive sexuality is might be different for another person or an abstinence based versus abstinence only can be kind of like a gray area. So I think it's fun kind of asking people what they perceived their Mm -hmm. class to be. And then, oh, go ahead. Oh, I would also just like to add the caveat that it was, um, you know, it wasn't a sex ed class. It was like a unit in a larger health class. So it was, you know, maybe a month or two out of an entire school year that we spent on it. And just, you know, for the one half semester or whatever that we (laughs) had in high school. Um, And then what age did you have your first sex ed class? Do you remember? I think for me it was freshman year, but I think it was dependent on like, gym classes maybe or something like that yeah well I yeah I definitely took the most comprehensive one freshman year so I was like 14 but I definitely had a little bit of that in middle school in New York um, when I used to live there so and even then like they talked a little bit about health Uh, or, you know, sexual health and, you know, periods and stuff. And I was in elementary school in New York also. So I think it kind of, it wasn't just, you know, this one unit I did, you know, it was built upon kind of in my schooling at least. Would you say that the attitudes were different at all between New York and Delaware? Did you notice any kind of like differences in the way people would talk about things or the attitudes? 
Um, that's a really interesting question, and it's not something I've really thought about much before. Um, but I know it is a unique experience, I think, like going to school in one state and another. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I would say, if anything, New York was maybe a little more positive and education focused, whereas I, you know, really remember high school health classes being kind of like fear mongering and very serious. So I felt like it was a more kind of accepting, nurturing, maybe um, an educational experience in New York. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, and then when you think broadly about your experiences, so you mentioned having a little bit of kind of a talk when you're in elementary school. When do you think was the first time you were kind of like, oh, like people are are like dating and like making out or like maybe even going as far as like, oh, like people are like having sex, <laughs> like that kind of idea. Oh man, um, probably my first like official health class was like fourth grade and it was more like, you know, if an adult touches your, you know, special place or whatever, like, you know, that's a big no-no and maybe like a little bit talking about periods and stuff because that starts happening or like you know or you're changing bodies that starts happening around age 10 so you know I had that talk then and I think people had like schoolyard crushes you know around 8 9 10 but you know it was never anything serious maybe some people kissed and it was very scandalous <laughs> but um I really yeah sex was not a thing at all in any of my friend groups until at least like age 13 is when it kind of started being talked about. Awesome. And then how did you learn about sex beyond just your classes? So you mentioned kind of having like the New York experience, the Delaware experience. Like, did you, you know, get a formal sex talk from like an adult in your life? Did you learn things from friends? Um, how did, you know, did pop culture play a role in your understanding of sex? That kind of idea. Yeah, I think definitely like movies and like people would kind of gossip about it on the playground or something like I heard that adults do this um I did get kind of I'd say an informal talk from my parents uh where they kind of explained things because I asked and my stepmom who I'm very close with um and who's been in my life since I was like five years old I think maybe when I was six or seven, kind of explained like periods to me and gave me the very, like, you know, when a man loves a woman kind of talk. <laughs> but, um, and I also had older brothers too, which I think plays into it as well because you hear them talking or, you know, they spoil things for you or tell you things that your friends might not know. So I think I did kind of know about it and at least have an idea of it from a young age. Even if, you know, it was still, you know, shielded from me, like my parents would skip the scenes of the movie or whatever. <laughs> but I think, yeah, it was explained to me in an age-appropriate way, I would say. Yeah, I think that sibling point is actually really interesting because I, I grew up the oldest. So for me, the extent of what I knew was pretty much like what people were we're talking mm -hmm. about and then it was everybody who would have any sort of conversations like I remember when I was in elementary school there was like a joke about the phrase like doing it like for some reason that was like oh, yeah. super scandalous that was like uh -huh. and, and it was like one of those like I don't know how many people actually knew what it meant but it was just kind of this like haha like mm -hmm. oh my god like are you doing it and it's like <laughs> like I think about it now and I'm like it's so stupid but like the people who typically were like kind of in the forefront of that were people who had older siblings or people who would kind of like accidentally or intentionally kind of teach them these jokes mm -hmm. so yeah I definitely think it's spread in this kind of like contraband way on the playground <laughs> between children um like you learn so much informally through your peers but also that does remind me like I definitely couldn't say the word sex without like blushing or giggling or something until at least after 10 years old like could not even bring myself to say it so yeah that's an interesting thing too like you have this like there's like a taboo or just like yeah, something about it that doesn't feel right as a kid, so you just don't say it. Yeah, absolutely. And then kind of focusing on a pop culture element, so things beyond just, like, people you were actually speaking to, but thinking about, you know, you mentioned having, like, sex scenes skipped on TV and that kind of idea, but is there anything that you kind of, like, 
stumbled upon or like any I remember watching like scandalous music videos as a child and like be like my whole worldview like completely shifting you know that kind of idea Oh, yeah. Like seeing a boob in a movie and being like, hmm, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> or, um, yeah, just like even when the sex scenes were fast forwarded, you still get an idea of what's going on. <laughs> and it, you, you're like, hmm, interesting. But um, yeah, and music videos is actually yeah a really good one because they're, they could be pretty scandalous, I guess. Yeah. No, and then something that we kind of talked about before this podcast was the importance of clothing to you and kind of perception of self and the way, and I kind of wanted to ask you a little bit about what clothing means to you in terms of understanding sexuality, understanding yourself, that kind of idea. Yeah. Um, oh, man, I could talk about this forever. It <laughs> is like a big part of my field, too. So I also have a very like academic understanding and interest in clothing as well as a personal one but uh, clothing is just so amazing because it doesn't like it tells you so much about society you, you can understand like economics m like military politics what's going on in a certain era or um, you know the concept of gender roles at any given time just through clothing but especially now you can tell so much about a person's personality and interest through their clothing and the way that they choose to express and represent themselves outwardly. Um, so yeah, clothing, I think, has always kind of been a thing for me. So, um, but yeah, and seeing how that develops too, like since I was a teenager and could start like actually dressing myself a little more and having more of a say in what I wear, um, you know, I'll say in high school, I probably, you know, I would wear low cut tops or, you know, leggings. I would try to follow fashion trends, but definitely wanting to look good and celebrate my assets. I'm trying to say this in such a diplomatic way. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, and I think, you know, now looking back, I'm like, oh, yeah, that definitely stemmed from a place of like low self esteem and wanting to get attention. Uh, um, especially attention from men, but yeah. And so, you know, as an adult that, you know, I developed a little more, I guess, physically and emotionally, <laughs> but, um, and yeah, now I have to think, you know, not only how I want to dress, but how to dress professionally and how, you know, you dress for different occasions in your life. So I think it's definitely, you know, really important and definitely linked to your own like sexuality and sense of self. So, you know, at work, this is funny. I actually had a friend ask me one time, like, where do your boobs go when you're at work? <laughs> it's like, um, yeah, I'm wearing like a sports bra and a baggy sweater because, you know, I'm working and I want to look like professional. I don't want to like be sexualized or you know, and I want to be taken seriously in the workplace too. So I definitely kind of dress in a way that desexualizes myself and um, just kind of, you know, I try to just dress professionally, but also, you know, showing a little bit of my personality. So like the other day I wore like a long vintage skirt that I just bought to work and I was like, so excited to wear it and be like, ah, oh, everyone can see my cool skirt. But also, like, you know, it's like a basically a floor length velvet skirt. So it's not something that's like, you know, sexy, but it's something that was fun. And I was excited to wear it in that setting. Yeah, absolutely. And actually the point- going totally off topic, I yeah, apologize. That's, no, that's great. Cause it's actually, it reminds me a lot of, I don't know if you kept up with this or not, but I want to say maybe over the summer, um, it was Billie Eilish who basically was like, stop sexualizing me. Like, oh it's, yeah. She was like, I dress this way because I am uncomfortable with the attention that people give me and the focus that they put on my body. And it's a really, I mean, it's it's so frustrating how much weight is placed on people with the way that they have to dress and the way that they feel like they have to hide themselves because like people feel the need to comment on their bodies. It's just, it's so. Exactly. I'm really glad you brought that up too, because I've actually been kind of paying attention to a lot of the like Billie Eilish related news. <laughs> I don't like her music. I like her as a person. Yeah, I feel the same way. For a celebrity. <laughs> but yeah, you know, she gets a lot of flack for the way she dresses, but she has like this whole reasoning behind it. 
And what really bothered me was that everything she said about it, like, came true when, like, paparazzi pictures of her were released. Yep. Yeah. There was the one, like, right when she turned 18, where she was wearing an unzipped jacket, and you could see some cleavage. And immediately, like, people were all over it and sexualizing her and talking about her breasts. And I was like, that's literally the exact thing she said she didn't want. And it says so much about, like, being a woman in the public eye, being young. And, yeah, how you, like, don't always have control over the way others react to your body. Yeah, absolutely. Even the recent one where she was wearing like a tank top and shorts and walking down the street and people were making fun of her body and because maybe she's a little heavier or she didn't look the way people expected. And that one like hit me a little more personally too because I was like, I have a very similar body type. So to see people all over the internet like you know, denigrating her and saying these horrible things, like, you know, it affects people, like, uh, regular people, too, so. Yeah, exactly, yeah, no, and it's, it's kind of the same thing, too, I, this is a couple of years old at this point, but there is the actress, I think her name was, um, oh boy, maybe Ariel Winter or something along yeah, those lines. Um, Modern Family. Yeah, and she wanted to get a breast reduction, and I remember being, like, you know, 17 or something and I don't think she was much older and she was saying you know I have back pain like I have all of these different things that are going on like I'm going to get a breast reduction all of these like grown men are responding to her being like no don't don't do that like that's you know why would she ever do something like that while she you know it's like it's it's not your body like why do you I just don't understand this feeling that people get where they're like oh I, I have to comment on this like I need to make sure and it's like Exactly. It's not and yours. <laughs> not to like downplay men's issues or like body image issues that men face, but I think this is something that women face a whole lot more like being in the public eye. Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. Yeah, Just I, an, you know, there's a million and one examples of women's bodies being policed by the media, uh, you know, authority figures and stuff. You know, and going back to school, <laughs> that reminds me, like, the amount of times that, like, I got dress coded, not yes. really got in trouble, but, like, someone would wag their finger at me or say I shouldn't be wearing something, and I would usually just shrug it off, because I'm like, mm, don't tell me what to do, <laughs> you know, yeah. and yeah. I thought it was, you know, sexist and arbitrary, and I didn't want to, you know, go along with that. Yeah, exactly. I remember being in, like, middle school and people I remember getting dress coded for the shorts I was wearing and it's like when I think about that I'm like you've got to be kidding me and like there's girls in my class who'd get dress coded for like um having you know the rips in their jeans so it's like they have too much leg exposed and it's like it was hot I took the bus into school because I was in middle school it's like it was it gets hot on buses I don't know what else you want me to do like, yeah especially we actually went to the same middle school too <laughs> so you know having you know bad air conditioning and stuff like yeah. what do you want us to do about it and yeah they would never say anything to boys really maybe a couple actually of my gay friends who would dress a little differently than other boys they would also get dress coded. But also, what does that say to you about gender and sexuality and how it's policed and, yeah, put under scrutiny in schools? Yep, yet again, clothing. Teaching <laughs> exactly. us of, it's really, it's amazing how it all kind of comes around. And it's so transparent in a lot of ways, too. Like, I think when we see it and when we actually talk about it, we're like, wow, that really that really happened and like it was so blatant <laughs> and it's just like yeah. nobody seemed to be checking it and nobody said wait why are we doing this why do we actually feel a need to tell you know 12 year old girls to cover their legs when it's 85 degrees outside and we're living in like you know Delaware humidity which sometimes goes up to like 80 85 percent on like <laughs> oh god I do always say Delaware is a swamp <laughs> yeah <laughs> And, you know, not to mention, like, the fraught, troublesome aspect of adults sexualizing the bodies of teenage girls, which is a whole other issue that's, you know, weirdly accepted, but really shouldn't be. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, that's one of those things where it's like, okay, so it's always adults who are making these rules. It's adults who are doing the dress coding. They're the people who get to decide what is, like, 
quote unquote sexy, which makes me so uncomfortable to say because it's, I mean, they're policing yeah. children and they're telling them that they're being inappropriate with the way that they're dressing when most of the time it's just them being comfortable. I mean, it's, you know, it's just trying to regulate body temperature or just trying to like, I don't like wear leggings, which I know is another thing that frequently got dress coded. It's like, we just want to just let us wear clothing. And I, I know this is kind of one of those issues that people talk about over and over and over again at different schools, but it's like, we're still facing it. Like, it's not like it's going away, even though people keep bringing it up and saying how outdated it is. So. Oh yeah. And another thing I, I know I'm like totally off topic and just. No, no, this. no, this is great. <laughs> but thinking about how different bodies are too. Like I could wear the same exact shirt or pair of shorts as a friend of mine and it could be scandalous on me and be totally fine on them. This is actually something that's happened to me a lot in my life just because of the way my body is built. So, you know, the fact that they're trying to also put the same standard on different people and holding people to different standards over things that they can't control is also problematic. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then, okay, so shifting gears just a little bit. Yeah, sure. Feel free to bring clothing back at any point. I love talking about this. Um, but how do you think these experiences, so actually this is relevant to clothing and, you know, sexualization as a child, essentially, and that kind of idea. What experiences do you think shaped your perceptions of sex? So like what, like how do you think you came out of that, if that makes sense? Oh man. Um, wow. Yeah. What a question. I think a lot of it is formed by friends and you're kind of like, you put yourself on this timeline compared to everyone else around you. Like, oh, all my friends have had their first kiss yet and I haven't. Or, you know, moving on, like, oh, all my friends have like, you know, at least gotten to second or third base and I haven't even had my first kiss yet. So it's, yeah, you definitely compare yourself a lot to your peers and like what you see in media too, like teen drama shows are so full of sex and sexualized that like it kind of normalizes it and it's something that you think you should be doing. So maybe even if you're not ready, you might start doing things just because you want to catch up or something. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. At the same time, you know, you are curious about things. I remember maybe TMI, but like I thought penises were gross until I was like 14. And then I was like, hmm, wait a minute. Like that's kind of the age where like I had, I don't want to say a sexual awakening, but I guess that's what you would call it. Um, so I think part of it is like natural and your own body's drive, but also a lot of it is kind of driven and influenced by society. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a really interesting point, too, because, like, I know <laughs> I was deeply closeted at this point, like, just fully. So, like, for me, it was so confusing having all these people who were talking about all of these milestones and, like, nobody ever once checked it. Like, there was nobody who came in during, like, my health class and was like, hey, by the way, you don't have to feel this way about men. Like, like we're talking about it in, you know, this very binary, very, like, hetero way, but it doesn't need to be that way. Like there was nobody who ever once checked that. Like, so it was really confusing kind of growing up and being like, yeah, okay. Like I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like it's yeah. just, it's really, really hard to, I think, navigate as a teenager when nobody explicitly says like, this is okay for you. Like we're, you know, this is how it works. This is how the body works. This is, you know, who you might be attracted to that kind of idea. So yeah, I definitely kind of get that and the the milestones and this feeling of like needing to keep up, but nobody was telling me how to like keep up, you know what I mean? So. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is something you want to include, but you know, I always remember thinking like, oh, Natalie is so pretty and cool and like guys are into her, but she doesn't really date anyone. Like, huh, <laughs> I don't her. she's just doing her thing. And then, you know, years later, like when you came out and I heard about it, I was like, you know what? Some things are starting <laughs> to make sense. Yeah, no, I absolutely, I feel like that's what it was. It was like so long of just trying to figure out what the pieces were and just trying to be like, 
why is it that none of this is making sense to me? Like people would very explicitly say these things about, you know, like wanting boyfriends and wanting to go out and like wanting to like, you know, try new things and stuff like that. And I was like, really? <laughs> like, I was like, I just thought it was like, you know, really shy or just like didn't get it or like I was picking the wrong guys or like whatever it might have been. And it's like so much of this could have been avoided if somebody had just very simply said, like, no, sometimes you're just not going to feel that way about men. Like, that's, like, just point blank. Like, sometimes that's just how it's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, and I know I spoke to you about this a little beforehand, but, um, yeah, I have, like, kind of pretty recently more come to terms with my own bisexuality. I love to hear it. I know, yeah. So, and honestly, like, I do feel like uh, – weight has been lifted or yeah I just it feels right and I think you know a lot of that like you said health class is very binary and heteronormative and it always you know I always kind of knew like yeah I'm attracted to women but like how important is that like uh maybe I just won't really do anything with that because it'll it's easier to be straight or yeah I don't know women are cool and it's hard to hit on them and there's so many like gender norms and societal norms at play so but yeah it really is worth it and important to like be who you are despite all that oh absolutely Uh, and it really stresses how important it is to have I think adults in our lives or even just like people we look up to who can validate a lot of our feelings and we can go back to it's this whole idea of like people fall through the cracks of sex ed like people don't get the sexual help that they need or just even the general like personal information that they need stuff that could literally change their lives like they're not receiving this information it's you know I went 20 years before I was like wait <laughs> like maybe I've been looking at this wrong or it would like show up in small ways and I'd be like let's let's repress that like let's we're not gonna think about that right now like that that's a lot to unpack (laughs) and it's like Yeah. yeah I I mean I'm really I will say I am so grateful for all of these different like books and movies and tv shows that I've been seeing where it's like at least trying, like, I know we make jokes all the time about, you know, queer baiting and like all of these different (laughs) shows that like try their best, but like don't exactly get there. But I'm so appreciative of even things like Riverdale, which I mean, I I haven't watched extensively, but (laughs) we get to see like girlfriends, like we get to see like, they are girlfriends who are on the screen and they sometimes show up in like my Netflix little like ad things. Like it's very apparent that they're in the show. And I just think that's so wonderful and so potentially life-changing for people because like for me it was you know being 14 and very quietly looking at like lesbian couple tumblers and being like why do I keep going back to these blogs I don't know I couldn't possibly tell you I just I keep going back to them they just seem like such a nice couple (laughs) oh my gosh (laughs) um yeah I definitely think that there's been like a cultural shift and um you know more sexualities and you know breaking the gender binary like that stuff is all being much more accepted now and I have a younger brother also who's at the same high school and um yeah like he talks to me about like his one friend who's non-binary or um you know and I just like hear all of the stuff that these teens are going through and it makes me feel really old but also I'm like (laughs) wow, like things I feel like are so much different and have progressed so much and have become so much more like accepting and, you know, just things are more fluid and things are, aren't as strictly defined and labeled now, I think. So I I hope that that's also being, you know, translated into authority and education and our systems. I hope at least that that will happen in the future, but Yeah, these kids are definitely giving me hope that things will be a lot less rigid and a lot more free and, like, accepting for people. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because I I know my youngest brother who just started high school. He goes to a different high school, but just started one. Um, He you know, has, like, he's bi, like, he just came out to me, and, like, I, I know, isn't that nice, like, it's, it's just one of those things, and for him, he didn't even feel like he needed to come out, like, he was just kind of, like, you know, like yeah duh (laughs) like 
<laughs> you know, and it's really, and he'll talk about, you know, his friends or, you know, just all of these different things and all of these people. And it's like, it would have been so nice as a teenager to have a group where I felt like I could go back to them. Like, I know now when I look back at high school, I see all of these people who came out in college and I'm like, okay, like I, <laughs> like we did all somehow find each other some way, but like, it wasn't until later that we all knew. And it's like, I wonder how many of us would have had a, a different experience and would have maybe felt a little bit more comfortable with ourselves if we were able to be like, oh, <laughs> Maybe yeah. the, you know, the binary doesn't work for us. Maybe this hetero lifestyle doesn't work for us. Like, this is just not who we are as people. Yeah, I actually, I, I guess I kind of came out to my brother recently. You know, he was visiting and we were drinking and he was like, hey, do you know this about me? And he was like, no, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it wasn't really a big thing, but I was like, oh, that's, yeah, kind of crazy. I guess I should probably, like, tell people I don't know <laughs> yeah at that, it's kind of one of those like we want to reach a point where you don't have to have the conversations where you feel like you need to sit people down you know and I think it's really nice where for you it was like oh like did I even say that like I like was that ever brought up I maybe I forgot to like I think there's something so wonderful about being able to have this honest feeling of like oh it's really not that important like obviously exactly. it's, a key, it's a key piece of myself but it's not like it like it shouldn't be a big deal that I'm telling you exactly and you're still it. the same person that you've ever been except now you can be more authentically yourself exactly yeah no and it's really it's hard thinking about the fact that there's still people who that's just like still not an option you know what I mean like we even though like I I mean I hate to say it, but like I don't know if you got the same feeling but our high school felt very straight I think in a lot of ways like I think it felt very comfortable to be closeted and just not really question anything like it just I don't know I just felt like there weren't very many people or resources or anybody who was like oh yeah like we should oh, talk definitely. about this. there was not a lot of guidance from adults and there wasn't a lot of space for people who were different I mean I feel like there were different parts of the school like you know, the drama club, and <laughs> I was in choir, and so, like, a lot of my friends were the ones who didn't really fit that mold, but, yeah, there was definitely, like, a very heteronormative culture at that school, I would say, yeah. and that's funny, someone actually recently brought up on Twitter, I think, how at our, like, homecoming pep rally, the big thing was, like, the homecoming king and queen, I think, the nominees or something would come out cross-dressed. Yes. Yeah. And that was like a big thing. And it was supposed to be like super hilarious. Um, especially I think like to see the very manly football players, you know, come out wearing a dress and a wig or something. Yeah. Um, and it's like, I mean, we were in high school in like 2015, 2016. Like, I mean, as things have changed but like we're not that far out like it's you know it's <laughs> yeah. like like I just you know and I can't believe you know 2015 2016 it was like normal in a school like I remember not really questioning it like being in high school yeah. it wasn't until later in high school and I was like wait this is weird you know what I mean like yeah. it's kind of this feeling of like is this is this really funny like I I don't know and it's exactly and the fact that like you know these people can get away with doing it as a joke um whereas someone who you know might actually just want to do that seriously would probably be bullied for it at the same oh, school. absolutely yeah because you mentioned earlier you know like gay men in particular who are getting dress coded for wanting to dress maybe a little bit different than what was expected of like a, a man quote mm -hmm. unquote and it's like you know we're you, like so it's okay to dress like that as a joke but you can't let people just dress how they want to dress in the day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. okay like it's yeah it's just really I don't know I think it's hard to hard to think about and it's so frustrating because it seems so like straightforward like it's just it's so easy it's like just let people dress in a way that makes them feel comfortable and don't make fun of people who don't want to dress following a binary and you know don't want to present in a you know a way that you find comfortable it's like let exactly. them dress for themselves yeah absolutely and let them present in a way that feels comfortable for them it also makes you think about schools that 
like even public schools that have uniforms and I, like I know that's a big thing at private schools too but um, you know removing agency from students I know there are some positive arguments for it like it prevents people from being bullied based on like class issues but at the same time you know it removes that agency and that like canvas for expression that kids have and the the way that you express your gender and your sexuality you're not allowed to explore that in school and you know it's like this system of authority that's being imposed upon these kids bodies just because it's easier for them they don't have to deal with you know dress coding or you know sexuality they can just kind of erase all of that by having everyone wear the same thing yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I'm then, not totally anti-uniform, but, you know, I think that is something that has to be talked about. Oh, I, yeah, no, I absolutely get the argument, and especially uniforms where there's no movement for any sort of changes. Like, you know, you can't even, like, do something with the sleeves or, like, maybe, you know, wear interesting... Or wear a funky belt or something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's like, you know, I, I can understand uniforms, but it's also, like, it, it's okay sometimes to just let people you know, spice it up a little bit, like, let them still show a little bit of their character, let them wear, you know, interesting socks, at least, you know, that kind of <laughs> attitude. It's like, you know, just let them, let them dress how they want to in small ways or big ways. It's, I don't know, it just feels so, so simple. It really yeah. does, in a way, it just feels so, so simple. And the ideas still persist. And it's like, I know, it feels radical to say, and I think this is something where I've kind of gotten used to and gotten very comfortable with in the last couple of months is this idea that like what I'm thinking is not radical like these ideas are not ridiculous these are not new like this is not something I'm just bringing up now it's like yeah. you know and I mean it's super relevant when we're thinking about you know like the Harry Styles cover with Vogue it's like all of these arguments where people are like why would a man ever dress like that it's like <laughs> Have we not moved past this at this point? Like, are, are we're really still here? It's just, it's ridiculous to me. And it just, it seems so simple that it should not be something we're talking about or something we're having arguments about. Oh, yeah. And, you know, along with the Harry Styles thing, people were talking about, I want to say Young Thug, but also you think of, like, Lil Nas and other, like, Black male rappers who, who have been breaking those gender boundaries and dressing in these different ways and they haven't gotten as much attention maybe as Harry Styles has yep but you know he wasn't the first one to do it so I think that's also important to think about and how um, race and pop culture also influences fashion and fashion is you know inherently linked to gender so oh gosh it's it's all interdisciplinary it's all interconnected <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I definitely, I really appreciate that point too, because it's, that's something that I think it's missed a lot in the conversation about specifically the Harry Styles cover where it's, he's not the first person to try and do this. He's just someone mm -hmm. where people happen to latch onto this particular cover. I mean, granted, Harry Styles is one of the biggest <laughs> celebrities oh, in the yeah. world, but it's, it's, you know, one of those things where people really did latch onto this idea and it's like, he is by no means the first person to ever try and do something like this and it's he's mm -hmm. and it's also something in particular too where as far as I know I think he's you know a straight man straight cis man maybe I'm not sure I don't want to speak for him but it's you know kind of this idea that it's okay because he's you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know how to articulate it properly, but there's kind of this idea that if you're doing it just on a day to day basis, if you want to identify something like gender queer, it's, it's weird or it's too out there. But if somebody like Harry Styles wants to wear a dress, it's, you know, super interesting. And he's like breaking down all these norms. And it's like, exactly. And it's just like the high school cross dressing event that we were just talking about. And I realize in an audio format, people cannot like see me emphatically nodding along <laughs> to everything you're saying, but it's happening. <laughs> it's like I'm trying to like get these thoughts articulated in a way and I'm like trying to like pull together <laughs> as you're like watching me try to like think. <laughs> um, so I know we have like 15 minutes left pretty much. So I just want to make sure that we're like touching on all of the things that you wanted to talk about. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let me see. So is there anything, okay, this actually might be a really interesting 
question. So what do you think you were told about sex? So like if you could sum up what the message was you're supposed to take away from like your sex education or kind of the perception of sexuality growing up, what do you think that would be? I think definitely in high school, like I said, it was a lot of fear mongering. So it was a lot of like, you know, sex is very serious and losing your virginity is a big deal. And they really like, you know, played up the threats of STDs. And um, I remember this weird lecture they gave us about like oxytocin and how when you have sex, it bonds you to a person. And, Forever, like, it, yeah. It's yeah, <laughs> and they really make it out to be so serious. And, you know, they always end it with like, you know, abstinence really is the best way to like stay safe. And it's like, like, stop trying to like push your agenda on me. And stop trying to like scare me and threaten me and just like be honest with me. And so, yeah, I really rejected a lot of what they were trying to tell me because it didn't feel like it was coming from a place of honesty or like they actually cared. And it seemed like they were just trying to like put this blanket panacea on all of these like, you know, horny teenagers to like just, <laughs> you know, try to, yeah, make it a non-issue. But yeah, I really think that it should be more comprehensive um, and yeah, less fear-based and more honest. Yeah, no, I really, I think that's that's a super interesting point because I, I remember taking probably a similar structured class because I think we would have only taken it about a year apart um, where it was something about like, you know, once you have sex, like with a certain number of partners, you'll never be emotionally bonded. Like every partner you have, you're going to be less and less emotionally bonded to them. And it's like, imagine telling a bunch of teens that, that like, you know, you'll eventually lose your capacity to like care for a partner. Like you just, it's this whole, like, I just, I, I yeah. still think about that constantly. Cause I'm like, that is such Me a, too. I a remember strange, that, be like, that's messed up. Yeah. It's a, yeah. It's such a strange message. And it's like, I mean, I don't have a background in psychology, so I can't sit here and be like, Oh, I know how the brain works and how like, you know, brain chemistry happens and things like that and like bonding. But it's just like, it seems like such a, because it was never presented with any sort of like medical evidence or any sort of like proof that this is actually how it worked. It was just kind of this idea of like, don't have a lot of partners because eventually you're going to lose your capacity to love. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, ah. it's like, okay, um, cool. Great. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. You know, I feel like I could also like testify now that that is just certifiably not true. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, yeah, wow. You you also get so much clarity as an adult, even just in your early 20s, as we are that, you know, on things in high school. Um, you know, I, I always thought they make such a big deal about virginity, especially for girls. And it's really not that big a deal. It's like, you're going to do it so many times in your life. It just happens to be the first time. And everybody's as awkward and a little uncomfortable. So I think like putting so much emphasis and like importance on it for teens also really is sending the wrong message and just makes it a much more unhealthy experience. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think the interesting part about it too is like, there's so much emphasis put on this idea of like, like in the sex ed world, we call it like the sexual debut, which I always find really funny. I think I've told you that before, but that term is like, so I just, I love it. I don't like know. That. It's like, it oh, feels, I'm having my debut. Yeah, and I'm it, a star. <laughs> it feels so like fun rather than like super serious and like something yeah. that you lose. Like it's something that you like participated that. in and it's something that you, it's, it's you, like this is your time. So I just, I've always really liked that language. But what's interesting is we put all of this pressure on ideas of like, you know, virginity and your first time, but we never actually teach anybody. We never say like different things like, hey, it shouldn't hurt. Like just because it's your first time does not mean it should hurt. Like that's not mm. how the body works or, you know, things like you might bleed, but that doesn't necessarily, you know, like that's, it's not a given. And it's also not something you should, you know, expect like it's, you know, it's, yeah. if you do bleed during sex, in some ways it can be something where you're like, oh, maybe we need, you know, lube or something, or we need to have more foreplay. It's like, it's, it's a sign from your body, you know, that kind of idea. Like nobody ever tells you that stuff. You just have oh, to like yeah. learn it. <laughs> oh, how I wish they taught you about foreplay. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I think me and so many other women would have had a lot better sexual experiences when we're young. <laughs> if that was, you know, more talked about in mainstream. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. And you know, it's funny because they don't really want to teach you how to have sex because really their goal is for you to not have it. But yeah, I think there has to be some way for teens to, because not that everybody, you know, has their sexual debut in high school <laughs> or when they're a teen, but a lot of people do. And I think there has to be a place for them to get honest education and a resource for them just to make things healthier. Okay, so kind of shifting a little bit. So this is actually, I think, a good um, segue into this next point. How has your understanding of sex changed over time? So we've talked about this a little bit already, but do you feel like this was an intentional growth or do you feel like you kind of just like would happen upon knowledge as you grew up? Like, was there somebody who like sat you down, like a doctor who was like, hey, this is what to expect or, you know? Yeah, well, I'm glad you are asking this because that's actually like what I wanted to talk about next, just kind of naturally coming up. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, you know, I've never really shied away from it, um, from sex in general. And, you know, I'll say it, I had my sexual debut in high school and um, I've had plenty of sex since then. I won't get into specifics, but um, I think originally, you know, I could say like, yeah, I wanted to do it. And, you know, as a teen, I was like, yeah, I want to do it. But, you know, looking back on it now, I'm like, you know, I think I had as much sex as I did or as early as I did because, you know, it was coming from a place of low self-esteem. And I was like, maybe if I do this, someone will like me and I'll have a boyfriend or something. This is like very real honesty time. <laughs> <sighs> but um, yeah, and I definitely, you know, used my body or like did things that maybe I shouldn't have or that now I regret because because of that and that ties back into the way I dress too so yeah being an adult like you know I'm realizing like maybe everything adults were saying about sex being special and like you know maybe they had a little bit of a point <laughs> I didn't want to admit <laughs> it back then but like yeah it's not nothing and it shouldn't you know Oh, man, also, I feel my perspective has totally changed after months in quarantine, you know, <laughs> having not really had any, you know, any sexual encounters in the last however long. Okay, maybe one. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'm like, wow, yeah, I really wish that I had respected myself more and like had higher self esteem and kind of saved you know, what I have to give for myself instead of trying to give it away. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah, it's really tied to your sense of self and you can do things that are bad for yourself and you regret it. And yeah, it's, you don't have to have sex if you really don't want to, and you don't have to push yourself or do things for someone if that's not what you actually want. And yeah, so I wish that that's something that I, you know, if I could give some advice to my younger self, that's what I would tell myself, I guess. No, that's really, yeah, I think that's honestly just a really, like, insightful and really important point is this idea that, like, I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, yeah, they, you know, everyone makes a great point when they're talking about, like, how important sex is and how it's, like, one of the most important decisions of your life, but it's, like, it's not like nothing, like you said, like it is still something that you are doing with another person and it's, you know, you should feel 100% in it and you should feel 100% comfortable and you shouldn't feel like you need to do something for somebody. Like, like this is for you. Like it's, it's something you are doing with another person because you want to and that kind of idea. And I feel like that, that sometimes gets lost in the conversation to focus more on, are you, you know, safety and, and scaring people out of it rather than, oh, well, do it when you're ready. You know, that kind exactly. of idea. And safety isn't just like, you know, don't get an STI. It's also like, you know, taking care of yourself. Absolutely. Um, I do want to just clarify, like, you know, it, it was all consensual. And, you know, it, I, I, maybe just my personal feelings changed after it. But I don't want, you know, alarm bells going <laughs> off. When people no, no, that. no. Yeah, because I, I think there's, 
I think that's important too, is kind of this idea of like, it's, it's just part of growing up in a lot of ways. It's kind of exactly. figuring you out. Exactly, you make like, mistakes. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. No, I absolutely get that. Um, and then kind of going off of that, so what do you hope to see in the future that people learn about sex? So like, is there anything else, you've already kind of touched on one point, but is there anything else that if you could like, make sure that every person knows and every like teen growing up knows, what would you tell them? Oh my gosh. Um, I think like, I think it's important for people to kind of explore their own bodies and desires and wants and needs and like really recognize what they want and why they want it. And I've said those a couple of times now, but I, yeah, it's definitely about having reliable resources where you won't be judged and um, you know, it's coming from a place of honesty and care. I'd love to shout out Planned Parenthood. <laughs> I think like they have, um, I've been going there for like all of my women and sexual health for years now. And it's, I've had bad experiences with doctors in the past, but as soon as I started going to Planned Parenthood, like I had all my needs taken care of, even things that I didn't think I needed. They're like, hey, do you want a free STD test? And I'm like, sure, why not? Like, you know might be fun. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I feel like that's the only place where I haven't been judged for my sexual choices or, and yeah, they're always just there to give you the resources that you need to be safe and healthy. Yeah, no, I, I actually, I think that's a, a great point to kind of wrap up on and, and the idea of, you know, the importance of normalizing testing and things like that and sexual oh, health yeah. and seeking. Yeah, I think that's a great point to just kind of, because we, we talk about sexual health all the time, but we don't actually talk about getting tested. <laughs> like that's one of those things I feel like it's kind of lost in the, in the oh, conversation yeah. is like, don't do it and you'll never have to get tested. But then they say, if you do it, you might get it. And then they never tell you what to do after that point. And it's like, well, it's, it's okay. It, if anything, it should be entirely normalized at this point. If you have multiple partners, if you're, you know, experiment, whatever you happen to be doing, wherever you are in your, you know, sexual journey, I don't know what else to call it, but you know, you should oh, yeah. be getting regularly tested. It's, you know, that, that shouldn't be, you know, part of the conversation. It should just be oh, yeah. you know, part of your health checkup. Yeah. I did have um, one half thought going back about, um, you know, my own sexual journey, but just in general, <laughs> like I think a lot about the orgasm gap and it makes me so angry <laughs> because, you know, it's something that I've had experience with firsthand. And it's like, you know, so many times when I was younger, a guy would say like, oh, I just don't like going down on girls. And it's like, okay, well, I'm not going to make you do something you don't want to. But like at the same time, they're expecting me to provide oral sex. So there was always a gap there. And um, yeah, just like I had sex for years and nobody ever gave me an orgasm. I was in a relationship, a long-term relationship, and I didn't have an orgasm until three years in. And even then you know, my partner decided like, oh, it's just so hard and it's so much work. Like it's not worth it. And I don't want to do it. And, you know, having that stuff told to you, oh gosh, I'm tearing up a little bit, you know, <laughs> having um, people say that to you for years when you're developing sexually, like I think really does do a number. On you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, I, started telling myself like, oh, I guess it's just me. Maybe I just can't do it. Or maybe it's just really hard. And yeah, maybe it isn't worth it. And I should just stop trying. Um, so, you know, obviously that's not great. <laughs> and so, and, you know, I was always like, oh, well, you know, I can, I can at least do it myself. So <laughs> I have that as an outlet. Yeah, I, I really do think we constantly put the burden on women to like be in control of their own bodies is to be able to say like, you know, this is what yeah. you have to do. And it's like, why is this not something that men are caring about? You know what I mean? It's, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's mind boggling to me that it's even something where it needs to be a discussion of like, like it is, I will admit it takes a little bit more work. Like that's, we know that about the, like, we know that, <laughs> like that's yeah, been it's shown. It's a little more mysterious. It's not yeah. as cut and dry. Like, but it's, you know, it's not like it's 
impossible. Like, it's not like this mountain you have to climb. It's like, there's, there's ways of getting there. And I think that's the part that like, people don't say, like, they'll talk about, you know, like, oh, it's, it's mysterious. Then they'll just cut off the sentence there. And it's like, no, it's mysterious, but there's ways of, of figuring it out. Like there's oh, resources. Yeah. There's, if you just ask the person that you're with. <laughs> like, oh yeah. There's no, like, you know, one, you know, <laughs> there's no one technique or one thing. <laughs> And yeah, it definitely is about honesty with your partner, but I definitely do wish they had said in health class, the female orgasm is real. How dare you even question it? The G-spot does exist. And, you know, it's important for both people to like, you know, the female orgasm is important too. So many times it's like, oh, sex is just over when the guy comes and that's it. But it really shouldn't be like that. And I don't think women, young women should ever, you know, put their own needs below someone else's and they should advocate for themselves. They should not accept less than what they want and deserve. So yes, this is my advice. I love that. I'm, fe uh, I'm feeling so empowered. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> like, I, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. So, and, um, Oh man, I would also just like to add um, my first sexual experience with a woman. I I did have more than one orgasm, and I'm like, <laughs> wow, that for you. the world could be so different, and you know, my life and my yeah, it could be so different. And I think everyone deserves that and deserves to find something that does that for them. Oh, that's that's exceptional. That's great news. I'm so happy for <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but I think that's. All I have for questions. Um, I know. I, I know. We could keep talking for so long, but uh, I have to go pick up my food, and I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for chatting with me. Of and course, then. yeah. I'm really happy I could do this. Thank you for having me on your podcast thing. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, before we, you know, tune out, I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to this episode of Sex Ed Taught Me. Thank you for supporting this podcast and supporting this kind of, you know, ridiculous hodgepodge idea that I came up with. Uh, just, you know, because I wanted to see it and try it out and see what happens. Um, a huge thank you to Jake Miller, who is the editor and kind of just the he mixes the podcast he puts this all together for us um i honestly think he's the reason why you're even hearing it right now so uh huge huge thank you to him and huge thank you to our guests who are coming onto the show um if you are interested you can find us on twitter and instagram at sex ed taught me so hopefully it should be pretty easy to find uh and if you want to send anything in to us if you would like to be a guest if you just have a funny story you'd like to share Share. If you have any questions or things you want to clarify or whatever reason it might be, you can also email us at sexedtaughtme at gmail.com. Uh, but again, thank you so much for tuning in and see you next time.